All right, people, we're back with another movie review. And Luke and I had so much fun with the Bayham on Thursday that we came back together. We teamed back up to talk this time about Michael Bay's newest movie, which I have now had a chance to watch. Luke watched it. How long ago did you watch this? You, you, you seen, had to see this movie for a while now. Uh, let me see. I think it was the 9th of... Was it the 9th of March? Let me 9th check. 9th of March. So, it, so was like, you, it was like two, three, maybe four weeks. So you, you've, you've seen this movie for a while. You've had this movie on the docket for a while. Oh, yeah. You've had this ranked within the Bayham. You've been eagerly anticipating to talk about it. I've been eagerly anticipating a new Michael Bay movie, especially because for a long time it seemed like Six Underground was going to be the last Michael Bay movie we'd gotten. And thank God we were gifted with this. Luke, you ready to talk about this? Absolutely. All right, let's do this. This is the review from Michael Bay's Ambulance. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Talking TV Twitch stream. We are live on this Sunday morning at 11.40 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is, however, 6.30, where my co-host for today, Luke, is Luke of Luke Reviews. Happy to have you back, dude. Happy to be here once yes. again. Yes, indeed. Like I said, we we have such a mutual love of Michael Bay that we had to we we had to reteam up in order to talk about his latest movie. And I wanted to start off the discussion with this. I wanted to start off with a little bit of a continuation for our discussion from Thursday. You know, just kind of reemphasis. What is it that we love about Michael Bay? What is it that he brings to movies that separate them from the rest of the ilk? His personality, his techniques. Just what is it about his movies that make them just so? endlessly watchable he's one of those big name directors that he he leaves no stone unturned or no no explosion unexploded you might say um and he just brings this energy to the films you, you can tell that he loves making them he loves uh, providing that cinematic experience to people and and he shoots it for real i think that's the that's the biggest takeaway I guess we'll talk about that when we get to the movie. 100 percent yeah so it turns out bay is another one of those guys that's had like a long long history in hollywood like it, it, it's funny because i remember it, it's funny because i i talk a lot about his similarities and comparisons to another one of my favorite directors david fincher and how they both kind of came through the same uh school of music vi of music video shooting and it turns out that they both have another uh thing in common so fincher when he got his start in hollywood he was actually an assistant editor working for american zoetrope and it turns out that bay got his start interning with but one and only George Lucas when he was 15. Uh, apparently, he was filling the storyboards for Raiders of the Lost Ark, which he thought was going to be terrible. Wow, I'm, I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing a little bit of a common trend here amongst the movies that Michael Bay thinks are going to be good versus the movies that are actually good here. But that's really, really fascinating. Uh, what's it called? Began to work at Propaganda Films. Oh, this just keeps getting better and better. Directing commercials and music videos two weeks after he finished his post-grad degree. Um what's it called his 92nd world war ii actually inspired coca-cola advertisement was picked up by capitol records and his first national commercial was for red cross which won a clio award in 92 um what's it called of course then he you know his success within music videos gained the attention of don, jerry bruckheimer and don simpson and who elected him to shoot bad boys and then the rest is history we already talked about his entire filmography this past thursday so we're gonna save that for uh, what's it called? So we'll save that. You guys could go check that out if you haven't already. It's available on Twitch and YouTube right now. It's entitled simply Michael Bay, the Bayham, or something along those lines. I'll have to redo the title later on. For me personally, what it is about Michael Bay is it's like, look, every single – it's one of those situations where every time I watch a Michael Bay movie, I think I'm going to know what to expect just because of, again – my, my brothers and I, we came up watching the Michael Bay Transformers movies. We came up, but not only that, we came up watching Honest Trailers. We came up watching the original How It Should Have Ended, you know, before they kind of went away. I still don't even know if they're making videos. But back in the day, oh, every time a Michael Bay movie came out, it was like an ode, ode to celebration. Because not only would we be getting something that was just so fun, so engaging, so awesome to watch, but we would also be getting a litany of internet material that would be just as entertaining, if not more entertaining, than the movie itself. And I know that that's a little bit of a double on top uh, that that's a little bit of a double-edged sword here considering the fact that Bay's own that the thing that we love about Bay is also the thing that's allowed him to become one of the biggest internet memes for move for um film Twitter for the last like 
however many years of the internet that we've been on, like 10, 12 years. So it's really interesting. But obviously, as time went on, I got into more of Michael Bay's movies. You know, I watched The Rock. I watched Armageddon. I watched Pain and Gain. And I realized, I'm like, no, this guy actually knows what he's doing. This guy actually knows how to make movies. You know, I'm like, again, there's just something about it. Like, he knows how to move a camera. He knows how to keep the audience engaged. Whatever it is that he knows how to construct sequences as part of his stories that even if they don't always work out, Damn, you can never take your eyes off it. You can never look away. Like it, like we were talking about uh, our conversation on Thursday. You can never watch a Michael Bay action sequence and mistake it for somebody else's. Like not once. Like we we I talked to decently about the late great Tony Scott. Again, that's a dude who was kind of the Michael Bay before Michael Bay was. He created some of the big, biggest and best action movies of the eighties and nineties. You know, Top Gun, Beverly Hills Cop Two, Days of Thunder, Last Boy Scout, uh, Romance, Crimson Tide, Enemy of the State, and. Don't get me wrong, Tony Scott definitely had his thing, but it's like Michael Bay just took that style and just ate it up to 11, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah, like you said about the action, not even just the action, like you can tell like it's a Michael Bay movie just from the angles, the, the oversaturation maybe. Um, he just has so much style to his movies and you know, that's that's what sets uh, directors apart for me. You know? can, I, can I see what style... They are. They have in their movies. So most definitely, yeah. I, I definitely know for a fact that like a lot of my favorite directors, they all have like a very distinct style. Like you're never gonna confuse a Fincher movie with a Coen's movie, with a Spielberg movie, with Tarantino, with Nolan. Like all my favorite guys, you know. And I gotta say, Michael Bay, he's one of those guys. You watch his movies, you know exactly who is directing it and who is behind it, you know? So you you can never, ever fault it by saying, oh, he's ripping off somebody else. You know, he is wholly original in and of himself. Now, as for that original style, that's a different story because I love to death, but he definitely does get a little bit excessive with this movie. Again, it, it, it's, it's funny because I feel like the long-running joke about him is that every time he, like, adds, like, a new technological development to his movies, he just adds, like, another thing for people to make memes of him about, you know, whether it's the, the, the low-angle shooting or the explosions or the overt patriotism or the frequent product placement. Like, that's another thing we forgot to talk about on Thursday is just how much – he seems to be in a race with himself to see how much product placement he could possibly squeeze into each and every one of his movies. I, I, I still think that probably one of my favorite parts of the critically acclaimed Transformers Age of Extinction is when he t is when after they crash their ship into a convenient truckload of Bud Light that has all of the logos post plastered all over the place. And he takes up Mark Wahlberg after a guy gets uh, after another noobish looking character that Michael Bay just loves to make fun of too. Michael Bay detests those types of characters with all of his heart. And he always tries to make them as like over the top as possible. And he has Mark Wahlberg come out and slam a Bud Light uh, open on the lid of the Bud Light truck and drink it. <laughs> it's like, dude, we get it. But now, with this new movie, Ambulance, well, I mean, we, we talked about his last movie a little bit, Six Underground, you know, and, and that being his contribution to Netflix. And like you said, they just, they, they gave him all the toys to that one. And that, that his big contribution seemed to be sound and just the use of the, I, ironically, I don't know, now that I know, obviously, that he interned for Lucas, I don't know if this was like a riff to Lucas and Star Wars or what, but Bay literally used the, <laughs> Bay literally used the THX um, sound as like an effect in order for, for their magnets that they use in that movie. And in this movie, Ambulance, his latest contribution to the tech is drones oh man oh, he finally yes. oh he finally discovered drones and boy does he use them i mean i guess we probably should talk a little bit about the plot but it's like again it's a bay movie you don't show up to these for the plot the plot it's, is simple. it's a gta 5 pretty chase. much pretty five much. star chase exactly That's what you need that's literally all you need to know. Yeah, it's Yaya Abdul-Mateen and Jake Gyllenhaal. They are a uh, a duo that you have seen in movies so many different times. Uh, Yaya's character, uh, Will, is desperately in need of $231,000 for his wife's surgery. Uh, he reaches out to his brother. I'm still not quite sure what exactly Jake Gyllenhaal's profession is in this movie. He's a car he's, trader. He's a car he's trader. Kind of dealer. He's a car trader. Sort. He's an arms dealer. He's an armor truck robber. Uh, let's call him a jack of all trades. I'm like, can we just start with Jake Gyllenhaal real quick because yeah 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 is the guy that gets into the movie but Jakey G oh my god I have not seen an actor go for it this hard in a movie and I don't remember how long it's absolutely fucking nuts like I, I don't know what your relationship with Jake Gyllenhaal and his movies are but let's just say that in recent years it has become very very apparent for Jake Gyllenhaal to go over the top in movies you know and that's kind of become his stance he's almost kind of a in a strange way become reflective of Michael Bay himself he's almost become a self-parody of himself you know 
Well, I haven't really seen most of his indie stuff. You know, I really should, but I think he was born to be in a Michael Bay movie to play the lead angry white man, <laughs> such as as Mark Wahlberg, uh, Shia LaBeouf, Bruce Willis, and Ben Affleck had played before him. He fills that role perfectly, and he does indeed. He, fill might, that be role the, he might be the best one of all. He like, might be. He so very well might be. Twenty four seven, like. Well, and then once... you know what. You know what the best part about it is, too, is that he's not even technically the lead. I mean, yeah, it's a co-lead no. situation, but he's very obviously supporting, too. It's it's kind of strange because Michael Bay, you're right, always makes those types of characters the leads in his movie. And this is the first time ever that he's made them a supporting character, you know, because um, I, I think the closest we came before this was possibly Ryan Reynolds in Six Underground. But again, Reynolds is just doing Reynolds, you know, Reynolds. That, that, that's the thing. And I talked about this on Six Underground. Reynolds is not playing the typical Bay angry white male antagonist which is why it it, it feels so um what's it, it, it feels so complete polar opposite to everything that bay goes for in his movie even though the action is still awesome but oh my god i look, look there I, I think there needs to be a special award recognition for overacting because jake is going for it in this movie in a way that i have not seen from an actor in a while and it's so crazy to me how bay pulls this off because on the one hand, he is an absolutely sadistic character who, like, as the and, and it's crazy too because, like, I'll break this down even a little bit more once we get into the actual like plot semantics of why I don't necessarily think this is the best movie. And it's only and I'll tell you why it's because this is the first instance where Bay is very clearly attempting to emulate Michael Mann. Like, it's so beyond obvious from minute one to minute one twenty or 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 one one thirty whatever whatever the time frame of this movie is. Because it's like you 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 got this very intense, very heightened car chase that takes place all over the city, right? And it's what's it called it's very clearly gonna end badly, but it, the dynamic is also around a duo of people. And it's another, like I said, it's a duo and it's a story technique that you've seen in a ton of movies before, where you've got the one guy who's in desperate need of help, you know, and he's but he's for the most part, again, he, he'll do some dirty stuff, but he's you know, he's a he's a down-to-earth guy, he's a family man, he's a do-gooder, he's only doing what he needs to do for his family but he doesn't want any violence and then you have the other guy who's just completely unhinged doesn't care is in it for the fun and the thrills and just is is gonna do whatever he needs to do in order to get through to the day and the the, the amount of shit and connections that jake john hall pulls off in this movie like we'll, we'll, we'll get into that because like i said it's the, i i think this movie's biggest problem is quite literally the the one it's always michael bay's kryptonite every single time and he's able to get past it in some movies and in other movies he's not which is of course the plot it is always his absolute kryptonite you show up for the action and then you think about the plot and you're like oh no because what results of course is they're i i can't even describe how badly they're 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 their robbery goes wrong because all the characters are like it's so beyond obvious like <laughs> jake jill literally calls one of the guys mel gibson to his face like it, it should be beyond obvious that this is gonna go wrong from the first half but it's almost like he's trying to make it as obvious as possible like, like that's the thing that constantly confuses me about michael bay if we could break this down for a little bit is michael bay seems to always trying to do parody but he doesn't actually understand how parody works. And so you always end up getting these really strange mixes that like end up with just a lot of characters just yelling at each other nonstop while there's a ton of action going around. And I don't know, like, did you think that this was his first attempt to be meta after six or rather his second attempt to be meta after six underground? Or do you think that just happened to be an indirect result of just his filmmaking style? I think maybe he's been in the business so long and maybe he's just trying to, does whatever he wants at this point. I mean, he's he's been doing that for a while, but but with this, it feels like yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna directly reference Bad Boys. I'm gonna directly reference uh, The Rock. You know why not? Um, and the yelling and the that I mean, that's just in every Bay movie. That's what you come to expect. And by this point, I've watched so many that I just it's like it's like normal to me. Like if they're talking normally, like what's going on? Why, why aren't they yelling? Right. Um, and yeah, I guess it is a bit of self parody, like his self parody or just parody. I'm not sure. But... I'm not quite sure either because like we've been saying for the longest time that Michael Bay has been a victim, like since bad boys too, that Michael Bay has just become a self parody of himself. Cause it's like the whole thing is that he directed, right. He directed all those movies for Jerry Bruckheimer in the nineties, but like, like, 
the, the way that I categorize it is that you have like the two distinct phases of Michael Bay's career, which is pre, which is um pre Don, Don Simpson dying and post Don Simpson dying. So famously, Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson are the produ- are the producing duo that did like all the big action movies between the eighties between the uh, late eighties and early nineties. Like I said, they did Top Gun, they did Bad Boys, they did Enemy of the State, they did Con Air, they did Face Off, um, they did all the they did all of those. And Don Simpson, Don Simpson, famously one of the craziest producers in Hollywood, uh, famously did all the drugs in Hollywood. Uh, died, I want to say like around like 97 98 so it was like right when armageddon was coming out i gotta check but i think armageddon might have been the last movie that he was involved in and so obviously it's after bay leaves bruckheimer after the disaster that is pearl harbor literally and figuratively that um that he ends up go th- that he kind of devolves into like self-parody territory which is where like i said the michael bay that we know kind of comes to play but i guess the difference being is that between bad boys 2 and now is that even in movies like bad boys 2 and transformers he was never trying to like be in on the joke it's it almost like like he generated the joke with those movies for sure and the internet had a field day like i said it contributed to over a decade of incredible internet content for sure but the difference for is that he was never in on the joke it was like a tommy Wiseau situation it was hilarious because of just how unaware it seemed like he was of his style but now it seems like in the age of the internet now that he's like almost become aware of the style and now it seems like he's trying to get in on it Oh, sorry, he's become aware of the joke and he's trying to get in on it, but he's still not like, again, that's not his wheelhouse. That's not what he's good at. He's not Phil Lord and Chris Miller. You know, he's not like a comedy guy, even though he consistently tries to be funny. You know, one of the, we love it, but one of the biggest and most criticized things about his movies are the jokes and the humor. You know, it works. It The way that I categorize it is, ba- is, is Bay's humor works the most natural when it's in service to the plot and the story. Because like you said, it's all it's all action. It's all people running around. It's all people yelling. But when it is in service to something like when there's giant robots fighting right above you or when there's an asteroid about to hit the Earth or when you've got three muscle bound dudes that are that have about like two brain cells between all three of them that are trying to extort a millionaire, you know, it's kind of justified. But now I, I guess what's so weird about this movie that we're talking about is that you've got essentially like a a pretty standard action setup where you know bank heist gone wrong now they're in a 24 7 uh new cycle chase between with the cops uh you know between them with with the cops on them while they're taking refuge in this ambulance and the only thing that's keeping them alive is this is this bleeding out cop that's in the background and the and so like i said all that is great and all that like i said it's pulse pounding it's tension filled all the way up until the end but then he cracks a joke. It's like, oh, it's like Bad Boys. Uh, he literally has a character. Also, I know you caught the Bad Boys of the Rock references, but did you have a character? Like, he literally just rips a name from Armageddon. Like, like Will Sharp? Yeah, Abdul Mateen, that's the name of William Fichtner's character in Armageddon. He straight up just rips <laughs> I, another, I, I character, didn't remember, I didn't another character's that. name from an early one of his movies. I'm like, I saw that. Like, that's, that's in the first shot. That's in the first shot, and that was probably the only unintentional reference that he made. Because although, I mean, I don't know if you directly remembered a name that he used in a, in a character that he put in a movie like thir- almost thirty years ago. But at the same time, it's like, come on, dude! It's like really. And so I saw that immediately, and I'm like, okay, what are we in for? And then we get to the Jake Joan Hall stuff, and I love how too. Bay wastes no time. You know, you 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 have the one line from the wife character who he needs a surgery for, who is nothing but a plot device. Like she's barely a character to begin with, and she's like, "Oh, don't go to your brother. You know, he's full of trouble, and he's only gonna get you wrong." And he's like, "Okay." And you think that she's gonna be the wet blanket towards him, and, and that he's gonna like have a little bit more struggle? Nah, he just straight up just leaves her house, and just goes right to his brother's house. And I'm like, "Okay, cool." And I love how too that they just ex- don't don't explain at all how these two are like brothers. They never say, "Oh, he's adopted." Like they make a bunch of jokes about it too. It's like, "Oh, he's adopted." Oh, we just hung out a bunch. It's like, no, none of that. They're just like, nah, we're brothers. They never say anything like that. And like, there's some references to it. It's like, okay, the fact that they were both taken in by this uh, by, by this one gang leader in L.A. But, yeah, like, they, they never reference it. I, I just thought that, that was that was pretty funny, too. But, yeah, I don't know. Like, we, we, we kind of, I guess, what, what are your thoughts on that? That was a little bit of a long-winded spiel there. I, know, I, I just, I don't need a lot, I guess, what i would say i'm i'm there okay i get it these these guys have been have known each other since childhood they're pretty much brothers you know okay let's get let's get the action rolling i get the point i get why he's doing it um you know there's not a lot of depth to it you know what 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 do we expect there's not a lot of depth to these movies anyway but um 
yeah, I guess it just everything worked for me. You know, I, I love a good reference, especially if it's to your own movie. Um, whatever the situation may be, it, it doesn't really take me out of the movie. It's more like, ah, okay, he's gotten to this point now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed the humor. I laughed a few times, uh, especially when they put the put the AirPods in. Oh, so the like, AirPods that killed me. That that killed that, me. That, that was thing. great. That was that was awesome. Well, I mean, again, it's just it's Jake for me. Like, is is the source of everything that's great about this movie. It's like every time Jake Gyllenhaal opens his mouth, every time he does, he is just he is so professional. He is so swat. Even in the most stressed out situation where he himself is getting stressed out, he just manages to hold the line. You know, even at the even in the last moments of the movie where he right right when he's about to die, when he just like pulls out and goes full on sadistic out of nowhere. So like, I guess here's my only thing that I have. It's like, so do you think Yaya? or Will, rather, I should say, was aware. Because here's the problem with Yaya Abdul-Mateen. Yaya has been in, like, already, like, five gigantic movies, but I feel like he's another one of those actors that nobody knows who he is. Like, even if I tell people, like, oh, yeah, he was Black Manta and Aquaman, or he's the new Candyman, or he was Dr. Manhattan and Watchmen, you know? He's already been in, like, three of the, I feel like, the biggest, like, uh, pop culture IP related things of the last like four to five years but I still feel like nobody really knows he was literally just played Bobby Seal in a movie in that came out during the pandemic with Trial of the Chicago 7 and I still feel like nobody knows who he is and I'm wondering if part of that is because of his name and I'm wondering if part of that is just because he hasn't given a performance worthy enough to stand out yet but I definitely thought that his performance here was really good this is easily the most grounded like character that he's played yet but I, I, I don't know. Like, my, my whole thing is I'm like, look, if it's if it's not Jake or this guy, I'm not really involved. Although I will say the rest of the supporting cast that he puts together is rather surprising because it's a it's a, another bunch of, like, character actors, as you can tell. But, like, they had a decent amount of people like Garrett Dillahunt, uh, Jackson White, Moses Ingram as the wife. Uh, I think they had um it's all like the little like, you know, the bit players that they had in there playing the, uh, you know, the drug runners and stuff. I thought that was actually really cool. But. I don't know. I felt like there were some moments where the plot, I'm rattling up the plot kind of just slows down and it becomes a lifetime movie. I don't know. There, there were definitely points that where it felt like that, like certain of the moments at the end where it's like, okay, we're, we're going to get you to safety and all that. And it's like, and we're all going to help him out together. I, I thought that was a little bit. It's like, okay, like let, let, let's pump the brakes here. Like, again, we know Michael Bay, he is in tremendous servitude to the troops and all he, he, you know, he wants to show them respect every time he can. And it was very, very deliberate that he made the choice for his main character to be a war veteran who was not getting the proper benefits that he was that he probably deserved from the government again. But that, that's nothing new. Michael Bay's been doing that since the beginning of his career, since The Rock. But now he, I, I, ironically enough, I thought that I'm like, wow, it's crazy how Michael Bay's been putting this in movies for like 30 years now. And it's arguably more relevant now than it ever has been before. I just thought that that was an interesting little tidbit here. But so... I guess let's move it into this next point of topic, which is, so you are a huge, huge avid fan of this movie. You know, we talked a little bit about the performances. We talked a little bit about the action. You are a huge, huge avid fan of this movie. I think you only had this ranked at like your number two or something like it's that. It's my number two. I think on the rewatch, it it may drop below Armageddon, but it was it may even jump up above the rock, but I don't, I don't think that's going to happen but so talk about but that when, for but whenever i can i do rewatch it yeah because like, my because i think i only ranked it um what's it called let me see here um i only ranked it at nine i think out of it i ranked it right in between 13 hours and six underground i thought i think it's better than the transformers than the two transformers the three bad transformer sequels it's better than pearl harbor it's better than the island it's definitely better than six underground although six underground i think strangely enough was more cohesive at certain points while this felt a little bit more grounded i guess is probably why i had it above but there were just too many moments in here for me personally where it felt like the plot was slowing a little bit uh, slowing a little bit down. They were getting a little bit too stupid. They were getting a little bit too ridiculous. Like, I'm sorry, but the, the whole scene with, with the Mexicans at the end, I thought was just a little bit much. I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, this is getting a little bit obvious here. Um, We kind of know that it's almost like, again, like he's trying to be in on the joke as far as, okay, we're going to, we're going to make this like all about a scenario where they're going to walk out alive. And just, I, I love how to, whatever these directors always put it in there where it's like, okay, we're going to try and make it. So it's like, these guys are, they're super evil, but then they're not evil, but then they get super evil because the one, you know, the, the one moralistic character, he, you know, he keeps screwing up, you know, they keep trying to do that. And I'm like, 
I don't know how I feel about that because it always I feel like ends up doing a disservice to the to set specifically, you know, because they're almost always played by a minority. These characters, I don't just feel like it always does a huge disservice to them. And I feel like just again makes them one note characters, which I get it. Again, that's part of Bay's style. I wouldn't expect anything more from him. But so you had this right, really, really high, like really, really high. I just wanted you to go into a little bit more depth and detail why that was. One thing about the the scene where they towards the end did you catch the bad boys reference where they're like arguing with each other oh, and of like, course of course that, how could i miss that that, that was I, I really enjoyed that i, I mean when they started like i've seen that when, when they started fighting and, too in the in the in the front seat too that was hilarious to me that scene yeah um yeah i think a lot of it probably had to do with the experience this is yeah this is only my second bay movie on the big screen the first being age of extinction um and i just I, the, it was a nice evening. I just had a Burger King and I was there. It was a big screen and it was ex con continuously exceeding my expectations. Uh, like you said, yes, it does slow down a bit. Uh, at times, like, oh, a thing happens. Oh, they're driving for a bit. And then a thing happens, they're driving for a bit. But I have this weird thing. Whenever there's a movie where a car is predominantly featured and there are tons of shots of it driving around, you know, I will more than likely enjoy it. Like, you did you show me show me some footage of a movie and the car is dri car is driving and it's shot well. You know, which Michael Bay. You know, of course it's gonna be shot well. I just really love watching it. I don't know. It's it's a weird thing that I can't really explain. Maybe it's because I watched Cars over eighty times as a kid, so I'm just it's just engraved in my brain. So and that's just what's behind a lot of it. And then they do get some pretty gnarly chase sequences in this you know there's helicopters there's explosions and it's all practical so of course it's going to be great so and it's just the simplicity of it i was like oh wow i'm watching a gta movie like this is the closest thing we have to gta the movie and uh, it, the simplicity of it and it's one i could watch again i'm sure yeah, it's interesting. It's part of a recent phenomenon that I've seen from a couple of movies where even though they're not direct, and I've actually talked about this on other podcasts as well, which is where even though you get these movies that they're not direct homages and references, uh, sorry, they're not direct adaptations of video game properties, but they incorporate video game elements and styles and story techniques in order to like kind of make the film like kind of bigger and better you know so, some other uh properties that i can think of a uh, wreck and ralph i thought was an example where even though that has other video game uh ips and characters in there it's not di a direct adaptation of anything same thing with scott pilgrim versus the world i saw that free to be guy. the case free guy 100 but for the same thing um let's go i also saw this to be the case with dread and i definitely got to see this with this movie where it's like it, it constantly baffles me where everybody is always consistently complaining over and over and over again about how we can never get a good video game adaptation. But part of the problem there is just the fact that it's like, yeah, do you know, it's just the semantics of translating the actual direct story elements onto screen from the game versus if you just have something like this where you come up with a flimsy enough premise for a story and then just have it be all action. It's like this is the biggest and best video game that, like you can get to me, you know? So even though this is a movie that, while it doesn't always work perfectly as you know from a plot standpoint it is such a thrilling cinematic experience from start to finish that it completely equals out now i want to talk about one more thing before i switch to um everything everywhere all at once i did want to talk a little bit about that movie as well i know it says ambulance up there but i watched everything everywhere all at once yesterday and i'm like okay if, if i don't talk about this movie for a little bit on the podcast i'm going to go nuts but uh, i want to talk about Isa gonzalez for a second because she it's so strange because I feel like in the last couple of years, you always see this. And I don't know if you've noticed too, but in the last couple of years, you always see that when a younger up and coming actor starts to get big, there's always somebody that almost looks like an exact clone of them that starts to become big at the exact same time. Like strangely enough, like right when Ben Schwartz was getting finished with, um, with Parks and Rec, right. And you had, um, what's his name? Um, uh, the, the guy who plays Steve on Stranger Things, um, whose name I'm currently forgetting right now. Steve Herring. Like, yeah, Herring. Steve Herring. That's, that's his name. <laughs> <laughs> that's the actor there. Anyways, jo Joe so, Keery. Joe, Joe Keery, thank you. So, so you saw him going up big on Stranger Things, right? And and so and then everyone was talking, making the John Ralphio comparisons and everything. But the one that I thought was much, much more underrated was 
the the kid who plays uh what's it called who plays Ruth's brother, the one who just got capped on Ozark. Um, Charlie Tahan is the actor's name. Uh, Wyatt is the character's name on Ozark, and he looks just like them as well. So you saw all three of those guys, and now obviously Ben Schwartz is a superstar on Space Force and Sonic and stuff. But you saw all three of those guys coming up and becoming famous right around the same time. And you saw something really similar happen with these two, where you saw Anna de Armas start to pop up in a bunch of like big name things, you know, like I said, Blade Runner and Bond. And she's going to be in the new, um, she's going to be in the new Marilyn Monroe movie that hopefully will come out this year on Netflix that Andrew Dominic is doing deep water knives out stuff like that. You saw her coming up and all these big name properties and a couple of other things before then. And at the same time, you have this other chick, Isa Gonzalez, and they don't look exactly alike, but they look just similar enough where I was starting to be like, Hey, what? What's going? What's going on here? You know, she it was because Isa is the one that did Baby Driver. Uh, she's the one that was in um Alita: Battle Angel. She was in I Care a Lot, which was fucking amazing. She was in Hobbs and Shaw for five seconds, and she was in Godzilla vs Kong. So they're both coming up at the same time. And I gotta say, I love Anna Armas to death. But Anna de Armas, the whole thing about me is she's always kind of had this, like, residual innocence to her that I felt like has prevented her from really exceeding in, like, some really tough, grittier roles. And I definitely feel like Isa does not have that innocence here. And I think that, in a strange way, she's, like, the perfect foil for a Michael Bay movie to these guys, you know? Like, because she can she can dish it. She can take it. She's matching Gyllenhaal beat for beat. She's, like, the way that she sympathizes with Yaya. But, like, the way that she handles herself and, like, the super intense sequences, like when they have to perform surgery on the cop that they're trying to keep alive while the ambulance is going at like over 100 miles an hour barreling through L.A. And then when the spleen ruptures, like the way that they the way that they amp up the tension just slowly but surely with every passing second, it's like, oh, God, and she she crushes it throughout the entire thing. I just really wanted to give a special shout out to her because I feel like she's not going to get as much recognition considering that Jake and Yaya completely dominate the majority of this movie screen time. But I really I really think she holds her own. I don't know. What did you think about her? Well, I guess you summed it up that she holds her own. That's the main thing. And. She or she earns her place among the three. It's it's not just the it, well, it is largely the the Jake show, but it's certainly the the Asa show as well. Um, but she, but you know, she's not like she's set up as a, this super right. cold, uh, you know, no no games kind of paramedic. But then you know, towards the end, she she kind of crawls out of her shell a little. And then she makes she makes a mistake or two. You know, she she shoots a person. I guess we're not doing spoilers fully, but you know and. Yeah, she just fit really well, and she has she has a bit of an arc. I think she, you know, if anyone can have a an arc in a Michael Bay movie, she probably has the biggest one here. Because like at the beginning, she never checks on her patients, like, and then by the end, she goes to visit the little girl, and yeah, right. full circle. Like, she, she's like thing. she's a taxi service. She again, she brings them from one spot to the other. That's what she does. And uh, yeah, I, I guess just in the sense of where it's really tough. To I feel like make the specifically because again we we run into this problem all the time with pre- predominantly you know male directed films you know it's just the way that it works in, in Hollywood as we know for the longest time and it's just I find it that a, a lot of the times it's like people have a difficult time making these types of characters work and not just be like emotionally stiff like damsels in distress and I gotta say be, both Bay and her do an incredible job of of making that character work like I really really think like the way that they establish her I personally think she's because her establishment they don't like kind of rush through it with Yaya and Jake where they're like okay you're already kind of familiar with these guys you just want to see these guys together we're not going to really establish them that well but uh with her it's like not nah, we, we spend like a decent amount of time with her when you know when she's on that first paramedic run they do a good job of establishing her dynamic with her partner that she's driving with the scene with the little girl in the beginning was absolutely harrowing I was when I saw when, the way that like they cut to like the metal thing like sticking out of her stomach I was like oh god I'm like god damn it the, the, the way that they spent time with her and the way that they kind of like um you know again passed her off and showed her like immediately transitioning i thought it was like really surprisingly well done and i'm like oh my god this is like an actually pretty damn compelling arc and I mean, obviously she's kind of the one she kind of becomes the one that i'm rooting for at the end because look at the end of the day yeah 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 of course is the sympa- more sympathetic one of the two but like he's still got himself into it you know what he should he like He's not an idiot. He knows what his brother was capable of growing up. So, like, this is definitely much more so on him than anything else. And it's like, I love, I love, I love just like how he acts surprised when it's like, uh, when his brother's like, yeah, everything's gonna be great. Everything's gonna be great. As they've got like literally every cop in LA chasing them for like the entire day. Also, another underrated aspect of this of this movie too. This is another one of those takes place all in one day movies that I find are not happening as often now. And I, I miss those types of movies. I miss those. I, it's it's strange because I'm also gonna talk about that a little bit with everything everywhere all at once, which is where. 
I miss the types of movies where you could have them as like these bottom movies where it's like all in one day, all in one place, uh, you know, all in one location, whatever, whatever. And the, but the story is so good and so engaging that you don't even realize that you don't even realize it. So that's pretty much everything that I have to say about the movie. It was a lot of fun. It was like, pul- like I like you said, like we both said, pulse pounding from start to finish. It's an absolute joy. It's not a great movie. It's sorry, I should reemphasize that. It's not a perfect movie, but it is an absolute fun to watch. I give it. I'm honestly, I'm giving this four out of five stars, 100. percent What about you? I'm giving it 0.5 more. I was strongly considering five stars when I was wow. walking out of the cinema, but then I thought, oh, come on, it's not that good. Yeah, but I would com- definitely. It's like a. It's a five star on the enjoyment level, but when I have to go and put a letterbox rating, I would put a 4.5. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another one of those things where you start to think about certain of the moments in there and you realize that, like, nah, I, I can't conceivably give this five stars. Like, that, like, don't worry, like, I love Chris to death, but that it reminded me of the time when Chris gave the first Fast and Furious movie five stars. And I'm like, I love that movie. That movie's an absolute blast. But I think about certain things in that movie, I think about the stylism of that movie, and I'm like, no. No shot. Has he seen Point Break? Has he seen? No, he hasn't. That's the thing. That's the problem. That's that's the problem. Exactly. He hasn't seen Point Break. He doesn't understand. Well, it's crazy because I saw Point Break after the first Fast and Furious. I don't know. I I think Point Break. Point Break is the better movie, but the Fast and the Furious is just. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. And that movie is like so. uh, That that movie is so comfortable with being in of its time. Like it is so comfortably cushioned in that peak like 2001 time frame. It's so silly and dated now, but it's the datedness that makes it great. It's 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 difficult to explain, but so. That's pretty much everything that I have to say about Ambulance. Uh, like I said, a lot of fun. If you're a Bay fan, you're going to have an absolute blast with this. But there's one more movie that I absolutely need to tell you guys about. I need to inform you of this. I, I did this a couple times during the fall when I w- you know, Chris and I would talk about a movie, a big movie that we were both able to see, and then I would talk about a movie that I also saw. I did it with The Card Counter. I did it with uh, Come On, Come On and Red Rocket. Uh, but now I have to give a shout-out because A24, Luke, I thought that A24 was done. I really did. I thought the pandemic would finish it. I thought that we were done getting some good A24 movies. We got some good A24 movies last year. You know, we got Red Rocket. We got Come On, Come On. We got The Green Knight. We got some good ones. But for the most part, I thought we were done with getting some quality A24 movies. But my investment in the Daniels that I held over since 2016 with Swiss Army Man. I missed their movie that they did back in 2019, The Death of Dick Long. I will be getting around to it. But the Daniels, who, if you guys are not familiar with, are a pair of Asian directors. They refer to themselves as the Daniels because it's both their first name. Their names are Daniel Kwan and Dan Shiner. And they directed this movie back in 2016 called Swiss Army Man that I have been a very, very vocal advocate for. It's a movie in which Paul Dano discovers a farting, talking corpse portrayed by Daniel Radcliffe. And together, the two of them go on a journey throughout the woods and they bond over lost loves and friendships and stuff like that. And these two guys are capable of putting together movies with the most bafflingly ridiculous premises and still somehow manage to make it feel really heartfelt and really enjoyable. And now they have put together a movie. That is called Everything Everywhere All at Once, in which Mich- that stars Michelle Yao as a woman who is the head of a Chinese household who is attempting to um, deal with their family's tax issues w- for their failing laundromat. And all of a sudden, she receives a message from a different version of her husband from another world within the multiverse. Because, yes, this is a multiverse traveling movie about how they have to stop a multiverse traveling uh, entity that is attempting to destroy all versions of her across the multiverse called Jobu Topaki. That is the name of it. And the movie proceeds to go into... I don't even know how to describe it from like a structural standpoint, but essentially what she has to do is she has to literally bounce across multiple different iterations of herself across the entire multiverse in order to essentially hijack other variations of herself and skills that she has, like Kung Fu fighting skills and stuff like that, in order to take down this entity. But of course, that only ends up being a presentation for the real problems, the internal problems, such of course, where she's having, you know, she doesn't have the best relationship with her. She had a horrible relationship with her dad. She is not having the best relationship with her husband. Her daughter, obviously, is a teen rebel. She, she feels like she's she needs to fill back in all the holes that she's missing in his life. The performances are tremendous. The action is so silly and so fun. The multiverse shenanigans are, it's it's gets a little bit headache-inducing but it's just enough to keep you completely invested all the way through. This is, for me, easily, not only is this the best film that I've seen of the year, but this is 1,000%. I will say, I was just trying to figure out which term to put in there. This is 1,000% the best movie that I have seen in a long time. It is so funny. It is so much fun. It is... It, it is gut wrenching in all the best ways. It, like I, I, I personally, I don't see how it's one of those movies where I tell him like, if you are a human being 
I'm like, you cannot watch this movie without getting something out of it. And can I just talk about the supporting cast for a second? Because Luke, you're going to go nuts. So obviously, Michelle, yeah, we're all famous there. And the movie does, I think, a really clever thing in the middle where when she's jumping across her like different multiversal variants, she jumps into variant. It was like when the character's name is Evelyn, but she jumps into a variant. I'm just going to use Marvel terminology because I feel like it's the easiest way to get multiversal terminology across the way. She jumps into a version of herself where she's actually like, became Michelle Yao in real life and she's just like she's at a screening for like one of her movies and like they're and like they 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 put in the thing a reference to Crash Tiger Hidden Dragon and I'm like oh I see what you're doing there I see what you're doing there so this is a weekend full of um you know people and movie stars referencing earlier and older movies that they did but um what's it called but there's the, but her husband in the movie short round. is short round and it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts because I, I got to break this down. So her husband is Ki Hai Kwan, who, if people are not familiar with it, is short round from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and uh, Data from the Goonies. Again, very, very big up and coming, you know, huge child actor from the 80s. And now he's unrecognizable because now the dude's 51. He looks just like Jackie Chan. It's fucking nuts. They, have, they even have him like doing Jackie Chan stunts in the uh, Jackie Chan-esque stunts and fight sequences in the movie. And it's like, so wait, was he always supposed to become the next Jackie Chan? We just got it delayed by like 30, 40 years because it's nuts. But then when you hear him talk, you still hear Short Round talking. It's the strangest thing ever. Like you still, like obviously, you know, he's 51 now, but it's like you still hear Short Round in a strange way. And this movie, like, like I said, there's a reason why I love these guys, these directors, because these directors, they are like the last indie directors in Hollywood. It feels like that actually know how to be fun and creative with a movie because, oh my God, the shenanigans that they get up to in this movie. So like there's, a, there'll be a sequence. And also I'd like to add to the reason why I said this is also like plays into the whole taking place in one setting because all of the multiversal shenanigans, all the fights that they do, they never leave the IRS building. They go into the IRS building in, in like, at like the 15, 20 minute mark, whatever, whenever the end of the first act is supposed to be. And they do not leave. For the entirety of that, like, yeah, they jump into other universes or whatever, but, like, their physical bodies, as they are, never leave that IRS building. And I was noticing that throughout, but it wasn't bothering me, but I was like, oh, my God, this is insane. And so they end up doing this thing where, in order to try and break down a little bit of the plot semantics, she ends up getting contacted, like I said, by another variation of her husband from this universe called the Alpha Universe, which is where also the multiversal variant that is evil is also originated from. And so the, he's jumping back and forth between his own universe and then their universe. So you got Short Round, who's just literally like snapping back and forth between being her regular husband and like this awesome variation badass of her husband, right? And then next thing you know, you have her dad, who is played by Hong Kong legend actor James Hong, who I still am not quite sure how he's even still alive, this guy, but they, they have him. And he just comes in, and once his multiversal variant jumps into her body, he start, he flies in in a fucking rocket wheelchair in the most cartoony-looking effect ever. And th again, you you got th th she's facing like every different person, and so the whole because the whole thing that triggers their ability to like jump between multiverses is the person has to do something really strange and baffling. And so you'll just get all these people just doing all this nonsensical stuff like sniffing salt or humping a lamp or doing some dumb shit like that. And then they hit the two like earphones, the, like the two Bluetooth things that they have. And you just see their heads snap back before they, before they snap back to reality. It's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. This movie. I, I, the, the way that I broke it down for people and I'm like, I don't want to spoil the stunts, but what I got probably one of the hardest things that I've ever laughed where you have Jenny Slate in the movie as this like typical, like, you know, like a, you know, spoiled, rich, priv privileged white girl. And at first I'm thinking like, oh no, where is this going to go? But halfway through the movie, when you have her multi multiversal variant attacking Michelle Yao, she literally starts swinging around her dog as a fucking nunchuck thing. It is the funniest thing I have seen in a movie in years. It is unbelievable. I, I am 100% giving this movie a five stars. I could not recommend this movie enough to more people if I tried. Please, if this movie is playing in a theater near you, I cannot emphasize, emphasize this enough. Go and watch everything everywhere all at once. This truly is one of those special movies. So... With that being said, that was my 20-minute long spiel on everything, everywhere, all at once. And, of course, myself and Luke, we had an absolute blast reviewing Ambulance. Luke, where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? You can find me at Luke underscore reviews on the Instagram. You can check out my full Michael Bay ranking there. Um, some people don't agree with me, but, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Um, but, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for having me on once again. Of course, at Luke Reviews across Instagram. Follow myself at Movie Nerd Reviews across all social media platforms. Follow the Talking TV podcast across all social media platforms at Official Talking TV 
podcast, be sure to also click the subscribe button. If you haven't on our YouTube channel, be sure to also follow us on this Twitch stream that we have going on right now. Thanks, everybody, who was able to join us this morning. Uh, we also have this episode going up on Spotify and Apple Podcasts on Monday. And be sure to keep tuning in for our new episodes of Talking Thrones that go up on Spotify and Apple Podcasts every Friday. And if you haven't been keeping track, we just wrapped up our Harry Potter first time watch series. We'll be putting up the rankings of those this coming Wednesday. And as always, people, 12 seasons in a short film and watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys next time.